This is the Bible in one year, day 61. A loving, ongoing relationship. In one of his last songs, Freddie Mercury, the lead singer of the rock group Queen, asked the question, does anybody know what we're living for? In spite of the fact that he'd amassed a huge fortune and had attracted thousands of fans, Freddie Mercury admitted in an interview shortly before his death in 1991 that he was desperately lonely. He said, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man. And that is the most bitter type of loneliness. Success has brought me world idolization and millions of pounds, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving, ongoing relationship. There is only one relationship that is completely loving and ongoing and for which we were created. Without that relationship, there will always be a deep sense of aloneness and a lack of ultimate meaning and purpose. At the heart of the Christian faith is this relationship with God, where we find what we're living for. How can you and I have a relationship with the creator of the universe? How in practice can we begin to communicate with God? What is the basis of this relationship? From Psalm 28. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me, for if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands towards your most holy place. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done, and bring back on them what they deserve. Because they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord and what his hands have done, he will tear them down and never build them up again. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry of mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people, and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd, and carry them forever. Develop a pattern of prayer. Prayer is a key way to develop a relationship with God by speaking with him. There's no set way to do this. There are hundreds of different prayers in the Bible. Sometimes it's helpful to follow a pattern, such as the Lord's Prayer. Another pattern that I found helpful is using the mnemonic ACTS. A -C -T -S. These elements are often found in the prayers we see in Scripture. The context of this psalm is fear, possibly the fear of premature death. David may be facing illness or deep despair. He fears that he might die in disgrace and go down to the pit. His prayer to God includes the following. A. Lord, I adore you. Praise be to the Lord. Even in the midst of a difficult situation, David chose to praise God. Whatever the circumstances, praise God for who he is and what he's done. We see another example of this in the New Testament passage as the people worship Jesus. C. I confess. Hear my cry for mercy. Ask God's forgiveness for anything you have done wrong. This is also a moment to forgive anyone you need to forgive. As Jesus says in today's New Testament passage, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. T. I will give you thanks. My heart leaps for joy, and with song I praise him. Thank God for health, family, friends, and so on. The importance of thanksgiving can also be seen in the Old Testament reading for today. S. Hear my supplication as I call to you for help. Pray for yourself. 
for your friends and for others. Interestingly, David says, I lift up my hands. This seems to be almost synonymous with prayer. Hands raised in worship is not a modern idea. It is actually one of the most ancient forms of prayer. Lord, I adore you. I worship you today. Praise be to the Lord. I confess my sins to you. Hear my cry for mercy and forgive my sins. I will give thanks to you for you are good. Thank you, Lord. For... Hear my supplication. Today, I call on you for help. New Testament from Mark 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Pray in faith. The great emphasis in the New Testament is that we relate to God by faith. We cannot earn the right to a relationship with God. It's a gift to be received by faith. In this passage, we see the importance that Jesus placed on faith. He said, have faith in God. He says that by faith, you can move mountains if you do not doubt in your heart, but instead believe. Jesus' relationship with God, particularly through prayer, lies at the heart of each of the incidents we read about today. As Jesus approaches Jerusalem, the people worship him. They cry out, Hosanna, which was originally both a cry of happiness and a cry for help, meaning save, we pray, or save now. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus drives out the money changers because of his passion for the purity of God's house. He says, is it not written, 
My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The passage ends with Jesus teaching his disciples that lack of forgiveness can be a barrier to prayer and to your relationship with God. He says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Jesus says, we are not to hold anything against anyone. There are no limits to forgiveness. Lack of forgiveness destroys relationships. Forgiveness sometimes takes great courage, but it restores relationships and brings great joy. It is said that the first to apologize is the bravest, the first to forgive is the strongest, the first to forget is the happiest. Intertwined in these events, Jesus demonstrates the power of prayer in the active parable of the fig tree. From this, he teaches his disciples about the importance of faith and fruit in our relationship with God. The fig tree had leaves, but no fruit. Jesus said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. I love the way Joyce Meyer applies this parable. If our lives revolve around the church, but we have no fruit, we're not living our faith. We can read our Bibles, listen to Christian podcasts, and go to prayer meetings. But if we do not have time to help anyone else, or even show kindness, we're like the fig tree, with leaves but no fruit. If we have leaves, we need to also have fruit. Jesus uses hyperbole to explain that we must be absolutely confident in God's readiness to respond to faith. In rabbinic literature, a mountain is sometimes used figuratively to denote an obstacle. Jesus seems to be saying that God will come in response to faith to remove seemingly impossible obstacles. He says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it and it will be yours. Lord, show me if there's anyone I need to forgive today. Help me to forgive. Thank you for your amazing promise that whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Lord, today I ask. Old Testament from Leviticus 7 and 8. These are the regulations for the fellowship offering anyone may present to the Lord. If they offer it as an expression of thankfulness, then along with this thank offering, they are to offer thick loaves made without yeast and with olive oil mixed in, thin loaves made without yeast and brushed with oil, and thick loaves of the finest flour, well kneaded and with oil mixed in. Along with their fellowship offering of thanksgiving, they are to present an offering with thick loaves of bread made with yeast. They are to bring one of each kind as an offering, a contribution to the Lord. It belongs to the priest who splashes the blood of the fellowship offering against the altar. The meat of their fellowship offering of thanksgiving must be eaten on the day it is offered. They must leave none of it till morning. If, however, their offering is the result of a vow or is a free will offering, the sacrifice shall be eaten on the day they offer it, but anything left over may be eaten on the next day. Any meat of the sacrifice left over till the third day must be burned. If any meat of the fellowship offering is eaten on the third day, the one who offered it will not be accepted. It will not be reckoned to their credit, for it has become impure. The person who eats any of it will be held responsible. Meat that touches anything ceremonially unclean must not be eaten. It must be burned. As for other meat, anyone ceremonially clean may eat it. But if anyone who is unclean eats any meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord, they must be cut off from their people. Anyone who touches something unclean, whether human uncleanness or an unclean animal or an unclean creature that moves along the ground, and then eats any of the meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord, must be cut off from their people. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Do not eat any of the fat of cattle, sheep, or goats. The fat of an animal found dead or torn by wild animals may be used for any other purpose, but you must not eat it. 
anyone who eats the fat of an animal from which a food offering may be presented to the Lord must be cut off from their people. And wherever you live, you must not eat the blood of any bird or animal. Anyone who eats blood must be cut off from their people. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Anyone who brings a fellowship offering to the Lord is to bring part of it as their sacrifice to the Lord. With their own hands they are to present the food offering to the Lord. They are to bring the fat together with the breast and wave the breast before the Lord as a wave offering. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast belongs to Aaron and his sons. You are to give the right thigh of your fellowship offerings to the priest as a contribution. The son of Aaron, who offers the blood and the fat of the fellowship offering, shall have the right thigh as his share. From the fellowship offerings of the Israelites, I have taken the breast that is waved and the thigh that is presented, and have given them to Aaron the priest and his sons as their perpetual share from the Israelites. This is the portion of the food offerings presented to the Lord that were allotted to Aaron and his sons on the day they were presented to serve the Lord as priests. On the day they were anointed, the Lord commanded that the Israelites give this to them as their perpetual share for the generations to come. These, then, are the regulations for the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the ordination offering, and the fellowship offering, which the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai, in the desert of Sinai, on the day he commanded the Israelites to bring their offerings to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 8 The Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron and his sons, their garments, the anointing oil, the bull for the sin offering, the two rams and the basket containing bread made without yeast, and gather the entire assembly at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly gathered at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Moses said to the assembly, This is what the Lord has commanded to be done. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water. He put the tunic on Aaron, tied the sash around him, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. He also fastened the ephod with a decorative waistband which he tied round him. He placed the breastpiece on him, and put the urim and thummim in the breastpiece. Then he placed the turban on Aaron's head, and set the gold plate, the sacred emblem, on the front of it, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took the anointing oil, and anointed the tabernacle and everything in it, and so consecrated them. He sprinkled some of the oil on the altar seven times, anointing the altar and all its utensils and the basin with its stand to consecrate them. He poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Then he brought Aaron's sons forward, put tunics on them, tied sashes round them and fastened caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the bull for the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Moses slaughtered the bull and took some of the blood, and with his finger he put it on all the horns of the altar to purify the altar. He poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar, so he consecrated it to make atonement for it. Moses also took all the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver and both kidneys and their fat, and burned it on the altar. But the bull with its hide and its flesh and its intestines, he burned outside the camp, as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the ram for the burnt offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Then Moses slaughtered the ram and splashed the blood against the sides of the altar. He cut the ram into pieces and burned the head, the pieces, and the fat. He washed the internal organs and the legs with water and burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering, a pleasing aroma, a food offering presented to the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. He then presented the other ram, 
the ram for the ordination. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Moses also brought Aaron's sons forward and put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. Then he splashed blood against the sides of the altar. After that, he took the fat, the fat tail, all the fat around the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, both kidneys and their fat, and the right thigh. And from the basket of bread made without yeast, which was before the Lord, he took one thick loaf, one thick loaf with olive oil mixed in, and one thin loaf, and he put these on the fat portions and on the right thigh. He put all these in the hands of Aaron and his sons, and they waved them before the Lord as a wave offering. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar on top of the burnt offering as an ordination offering, a pleasing aroma, a food offering presented to the Lord. Moses also took the breast, which was his share of the ordination ram, and waved it before the Lord as a wave offering, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil, and some of the blood from the altar, and sprinkled them on Aaron and his garments, and on his sons and their garments. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments, and his sons and their garments. Moses then said to Aaron and his sons, Cook the meat at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and eat it there with the bread from the basket of ordination offerings as I was commanded. Aaron and his sons are to eat it. Then burn the rest of the meat and the bread. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed, for your ordination will last seven days. What has been done today was commanded by the Lord to make atonement for you. You must stay at the entrance to the tent of meeting, day and night, for seven days, and do what the Lord requires, so that you will not die. For that is what I have been commanded. So Aaron and his sons did everything the Lord commanded through Moses. Approach God through Jesus. The way to relate to God in the Old Testament was through the priesthood, because of sin. Human beings could not relate directly to God. They needed to go through a priest. And in particular, they needed a high priest. In this passage, we see how Aaron was anointed for this task. Moses poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Aaron was a forerunner of Jesus Christ. The word Christ means the anointed one. Aaron's priesthood was fallible. He had to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as the people's. Jesus is the great high priest. Through Jesus, you can relate to God with confidence and have a direct relationship with him. As the writer of Hebrews puts it, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In fact, because of Jesus' sacrifice for your sins, you are in an even better position than the Old Testament priests. Through repentance and forgiveness, your relationship with God is utterly transformed and you can come directly into God's presence, just as the Old Testament priests did when they entered the tent of meeting. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Lord, thank you that through Jesus, I can approach the throne of grace with confidence and receive mercy and grace. Help me to stay close to you and walk in a loving, ongoing relationship with you. Pepper adds, in Psalm 28, I love the combination of God being our strength and shield and the gentle shepherd who carries us forever. 
Maybe today you feel you need caring.